Hello, Janet Porter. Hello. <laughs> this is a sad day. It is a sad day. So I have been in between some of our calls and Wahi work. I've been watching television. I know she became queen at 25 years old. Can I know, you know, and I actually I had my Wahi book group met last night. We have this I evening know. Zoom Wahi book group. And I said to everybody, I just want to know, I'm really not, I'm, I'm an anti-monarchist. I don't really believe in the monarchy, but I'm going to be really sad when Elizabeth, yes. Queen Elizabeth dies. Right. I just said that to my book group last night and, um, and I came home and Jim told me that she died. And I thought, you know, she's the only queen all of us have ever known. Ever known. I know it's just, and you know, on what's interesting is on Tuesday, she had her last formal, you know, public appearance with the new prime minister, a Liz Truss, and that was her last picture. And she looked very frail, but she was there shaking her hand and here two days later, she's she's gone. And interest, isn't it interesting that she was a woman and now we have a, a male king and we have a female, <laughs> we have a female prime minister now. Yes, in, yeah, in, yeah. In yeah, United Kingdom. Well, I was talking about the fact that um, it bothers me that I live in a country that's never had a female president yes. and a place like Great Britain has had three female prime ministers. I mean, you. look at all the developing countries, Germany, Angela Merkel, Thank I mean, you. we could go on and on, Indira Gandhi, you know, New Zealand. I mean, you know, right. many of the developing countries have been yeah. less gender biased. <laughs> um, um, I wanted to say for those ladies that have already signed on, we will officially begin this author uh, webinar, author series webinar at five o'clock. Uh, this is our time, uh, Janet and I, to kind of catch up and, and say hi to each other and chit chat. But we have a wonderful uh, historical novelist, historical fiction novelist, Amanda Skenendor. And her book is The Nurse's Secret. And Janet has read it. It's a thriller, historical nonfiction that takes place in the 1880s in New York City at Bellevue Hospital. So I'm mean, really excited to, to have you interview her. But before we do that at five o'clock, Janet, I know that you've had a medical uh, procedure where you have had a new another new knee. And how are you doing? Um, I'm doing good. I had it done at Hilton Head Hospital by Dr. Kirk Johnson. And I, I've had a really, really good process and good outcome. So I bet, but it's not, getting your knee replaced is not for the faint part of it. You, you have to, you have to be committed. So, um, so um, anyway, and I was going to say also uh, the book that we're talking about today, which we'll talk about more later, also presents a, uh, Amanda's going to talk about how she got inspired to write about Bellevue in the 1880s, but they were one of the first hospitals you know, it was after the Crimean War with uh, Florence Nightingale that nursing as a profession became established. And Bellevue had one of the first nursing training programs in the United States for nurses. So it's also, um, she, she said it in an interesting time frame um, in terms of, the, you know, understanding the history of nursing and, and what, what it was like for women in the 1880s to try to get established as nurses. And um, so I, it's, uh, it, ha, it, it has many, it, it is a thriller, and, uh, but, it, but it has, so it has many aspects. And you know, our audience, Robin, loves historical fiction. I know, because our, our authors have predominantly been historical fiction as we look back. And actually, this is our 25th webinar. We've been doing this over two and a half years. <laughs> so I guess we've got some long staying power. <laughs> we've had some great authors and it's been a lot of fun and Janet you do a super job of really digging in and and really getting to know kind of you know how they got motivated what what the the behind the scenes work with their characters and how they've developed the character and research into a lot of their and a lot of their work so it's been um it's been really fun it's been great. you know I, this is a little off topic but I, I had a pedicure today and the woman uh next to me was bragging about she has a se seven year old and an eleven year old boy and how much they love the library. Yeah. So how she picks them up for school and that the treat every day is to go to the library. They 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 want to go to the library and they like to hold the books book. in their hand. You know they like to hold books in their hand. And I said to her, I think one of the greatest gifts that you can give a child is the love of reading. 
Yes. And and we were talking last night in the Wahi book group I'm in about how, um, you know, how much reading I have to say personally saved me during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we could all immerse ourselves in books and, you know, kind of shut out the Ukraine and, you know, the political divide and, you know, the, what was going on with, and just immerse ourselves in a book was such a, such a incredible mental health uh, you know, exercise for me. And I think for so many of us. And so, you know, everybody who's on today is probably was probably blessed with a mom who took them to the library, a mom yep. or dad who took them to the library. You know, there's something about libraries. I've always loved libraries and, and I'll go to a library and I'll, and then I'll have to like rush out or whatever. And I, and it's like, I really want to just stay here and just sit and walk through the different, you know, stacks of books and look at all the titles. And I just, I just, there's something about being in a library that's so just mesmerizing, enticing. I just love it. Well, and this, the, the library has so many programs. I'm on the board and <laughs> I didn't even know this, this woman next to me in the pedicure chair said that uh, they, they give points for how many books kids have read. Right. And their son, they, they have to get so many points. And then they get, the, the kids get a free meal at any Surge restaurant. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Surge has a relationship, it's the Surge That's group, cool. you know, which has Frankie Bones and Wise Guys and on and on and on. What um, a partnership. Yeah. I know. That is and so, so cool. the, the kids are like, we're halfway there to a free meal. <laughs> um, um, oh, and cool. uh, so they have so they have so many programs. It's hard to keep track of all of them. And of course, in the summer, Robin, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have an incredible summer reading program where the kids come to the library and they get fed. You know, we have food trucks there where they get food oh, wow. because a lot of these kids who don't have don't live right. in impoverished situations, you know, mm -hmm. get their meals at lunch. You know, their major meal is at lunch at school. And um so we had a very robust program this summer with kids coming to get meals and, you know, pick up a library book. And, yeah, um, that's and great. so we've, we've been blessed with really good local partners at, in mm -hmm. the Beaufort County to help us combine reading and, you know, getting some credits. Like yeah. they, the summer reading program it calls getting kids, getting all kinds of prizes that they can win. <laughs> you know, once they've read 20 books, once they've read right. 40 books. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm really proud of our library system. Well, and, uh, and we want to ask our ladies, if you've read a good book lately, then go down to that chat button on your laptop or your iPad or your phone, whatever, and give us some recommendations of books that you've read throughout this summer. I cannot believe we're moving into the middle of September. <laughs> Before we know it, Halloween will be here and Thanksgiving. We're already making family plans for Thanksgiving with our kids. So, I mean, it's like the summer's gone, done, except it's still hot outside, but today was kind of nice. The yeah. We haven't experienced the awful, awful heat in the West though. No. How lucky we've been. I know. Horrible. The terrible. Because those people, you know, there's people in communities like that in California that don't have air conditioning because they I know. It's so temperate. And imagine if you're in any age, but especially if you're elderly and you're living with no air conditioning. I mean, I, I my heart just goes out. To well, you, those know, people. you know, I think about when I first moved to South Carolina in the 60s from Michigan and we had a ceiling fan and not a ceiling fan, um, an attic fan. We didn't have air conditioning back in the 60s and the early 70s. Even people in the South didn't have air conditioning. But we had this big fan that would go at night. <coughs> Excuse me. Got a little bit of a tickle in my throat. Um. But yeah, I mean, I just living without air conditioning, tough. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really, and you know, they they we don't keep good records, but we have horrible public health crises. Like there was one in Chicago about twenty years ago. That's a famous one where there was a heat wave, and like hundreds of people died. Yep. You know, alone in their apartments, um, and. Uh, you know, the morgues were full, overflowing. I mean, it was horrible. So, yep. you know, excess heat is really a public health disaster, just yeah. like the pandemic is. Right. Well, hopefully we're out of the pandemic, at least. I mean, I know there are still some folks that are getting the COVID, but um, we're we're on the backside of it. And we've got a, a great year of programming with Wahi. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. 
of our session today, our webinar today. But at this time, I guess I'm going to go ahead and we'll start our webinar, Janet. I think that sounds good. Like a plan? <laughs> I'll see you in just a minute. Okay. It is five o'clock and we'd like to welcome all of you to the Women's Association of Hilton Head Islands author series for 2022. We're in the fall of 2022. This is our 25th webinar. I'm Robin Zimmerman. I've been serving as your moderator along with Janet Porter, who has been our interviewer. And we have a very exciting author for you today. Her name is Amanda Skenendor. She's written a book called The Nurse's Secret. It's her most recent book, and it is an historical fiction. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring on Janet because I need to do a, a quick little cough. Janet, you want to come in? I got a little tickle in my throat. Yes. Yeah, I know, Robin, you've got a little bit of a cold. I do. Um, so so uh, it's, <clears throat> my, it's my pleasure today to introduce all of you to Amanda Skenendorf. She may not need an introduction for most of you, but um, she's she's a best-selling author, and um, I'm going to stop and, your video, Robin. Okay. And um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Amanda, who's joining us today. Um, she gonna, she's going to be discussing her latest novel called The Nurse's Secret. And Amanda is actually a nurse herself, and many of her books have a medical overtone, having having you know have a medical aspect to them. Um, she, you may know her because she was the award-winning author of three additional historical novels, The Second Life of Mario West, The Undertaker's Assistant, and Between Earth and Sky. Um, she's also, a, not in addition to being a registered nurse, she's a certified infection prevention expert. When she's not writing or chasing germs, Amanda spends her time curled up on the couch with a book and cup of tea or tending to our many plant houseplants. She's joining us today from Las Vegas, where she lives with her husband, Stephen, and their pet turtle, Lenore. So welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, I'm so honored to meet you. I've read your books and, um, you know, they were just page turners. Just every one of them was page turners. So, um, so, so, so let's give everyone a brief introduction, Amanda, to The Nurse's Secret, kind of what it's about the time is set in and, and what inspired you to write that book? Sure. Well, so uh, counter to the, the title, the story is actually about a thief. Uh, her name is Una. She's living in the slums of New York City in the 1880s and is erroneously arrested by the police for a crime, a murder that she didn't commit. She's able to um, escape their clutches, but she knows she's got to um, lay low because they're looking for her. And so she lies her way into the Bellevue nurse training program, which was um, the very first nurse training program that we had here in the United States at this time in the 1880s. It's brand new. And it only takes women who are of um, what they would call good breeding. So you had to be educated. You had to be very prim and proper. Um, you needed to be obedient. And Una is none of these things, right? But she's she's a, a con woman extraordinaire and she lies her way in. And then sort of flounders because this is an entirely different world from the world that she knew on the streets. And of course, you know, being a thief and sort of um, used to that rough and tumble world, there are parts of the hospital that she's really good at, right? She's not afraid of the sight of blood and things like that. But again, getting along with her other classmates and, you know, posing as this ladylike woman is very difficult. And just as she's getting her footing, there is a suspicious death at the hospital that's followed not too long after by another. And Una starts to suspect that maybe something is going on. But as she starts to delve more deeply into these, what she comes to believe are murders, she realizes that she's got this choice, right? Do I keep going and investigating this and thereby protecting the patients at the hospital and some of the, the staff, these people that she's come to call her friends? Or does she keep doing what she's always done, kind of keep her head low, and look out for herself. And that becomes sort of the crux of the story. So and what inspired you? Where did you come up with this idea? Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm a nurse and I was I was interested in the history of the profession. It's not something that we spend a lot of time about or, or really almost any time at in school, right? Like you need to know <laughs> the important things, the vital signs and 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 you know how to take care of someone who's sick. Um, but the more that I learned in particular, uh, right before this time, 
the 1870s, 1880s, kind of right after the Civil War, like before that, nurses were entirely untrained. And a lot of the times they were illiterate. They would find women from workhouses and prisons and, and throw them onto the ward and say, here, take care of 20 patients. And that just, you know, it, it fascinated me because that's so different from how, what nursing has become, right? Um, you know, they would talk about these women, they would steal the patient's food, they would steal their whiskey, which was prescribed to patients very liberally back in those days. Um, and that the hospital in general was a place like no one wanted to go because the mortality rate there was huge. They didn't have a sense of germ theory um, or the importance of cleanliness and how that all came to, sort of came together. And so this moment, right, where you have this first nursing school at Bellevue that opened up in uh, 1873 was sort of this really interesting pivot point where you go from these, you know, ex-convicts um, to women that, you know, like I was saying, they're really um, very, very prim, very proper. The, the, the number one reason that they would turn a woman away was because of bad breeding. And it really, I think, made what our vision of a nurse was in a very, very narrow mold. And we've spent, um, I would say, the last you know 150 years trying to break out of that mold because nurses are so much more than just just that, just these sort of quiet, silent, obedient um, women. And and a lot of that was the fact that at the time uh, women couldn't be physicians either, and doctors were very afraid that if they let women like learn how to be nurses that they're just going to want to become doctors and they'll see this as a way to get into the medical profession and so they really I think pinned down what nurses were able to do and what was expected of them and there are echoes of that that I still see very much alive today in in the in the profession and so I was interested in in exploring that um, and then and again also just that wild wild world of 19th century medicine where you know, people didn't really understand about germs and you, you know, anesthesia was brand new and that, that sort of thing. It was, it was all very fascinating to me and that's sort of what inspired the story. Yes. You know, um, in terms of still trying to contain nurses, um, I'm a hospital administrator and 20 years ago, I, um, I testified before the state legislature in Ohio to advocate for nurse practitioners to having prescribing privileges. Um, a lot of nurse practitioners and um, were in rural Appalachia, you know, functioning on their own. And, yeah. and um, I had major uproar from my medical staff because I was extending, you know, privileges to nurses that they shouldn't have. Took another 20 years in Ohio for them to pass that legislation. So oh, those, right. those, because our licensing of how people, what people can and cannot do medically mm -hmm. is a state driven process. Yes. Those battlegrounds are still being fought you know, all over the country, don't you find it state by state where people are trying to give nurses who are well-trained mm -hmm. you know, um, more leeway in terms of what they can do for, to support their patients and the medical societies are fighting it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you do, so that, you do see that. Yeah, so it's it's still ongoing. Here we are, uh, 140 yes. years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so have you been to Bellevue? Um, I, I I have, but I had it, didn't have the chance to go before I wrote the story. So I was writing the story as COVID was happening, and um, and couldn't go. But then uh, a couple of months ago, my husband and I made a trip to New York, and I visited. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. it's quite a place. It is. It is. It's it's and it's so neat that. Um, they some people will say that it's the oldest hospital in the United States, but I think that's very very disputed. <laughs> And probably not true, but it is absolutely one of the oldest, um, yeah. you know, uh, hospitals. And certainly I think the oldest hospital in New York. So really, yeah. and as a historical fiction author and just, I guess, history lover, I love, <laughs> I love those, those type of things. One of my friends was the CEO there 20 years ago. Um, and I said to Alan, um, tell me about Bellevue. He said, well, a third of our patients are homeless, a third are HIV and a third are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I mean, like Cook County Hospital, it has a reputation of being a, you know, really, really challenging environment to, to run as a hospital. So um, you have a history of writing about um, two things, women who have some medical connection, where there's a medical connection, like in Muriel West and The Undertaker's Assistant, 
And you also have uh, kind of a genre of um, having your female characters, lead characters be um, flawed individuals. You know, mm-hmm. none of none of your women are Pollyanna, right? No. Or, or <laughs> Rebecca, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. So talk <laughs> about talk about where that comes from. Yeah, I, th- I think first and foremost for me, I want to take my characters, my main characters in particular, on a journey. And if they start off too perfect or perfect at all, then, then where do they go from there? Um, I'm interested in in the growth, right? In exploring growth and change. And so having a character um, like Muriel or Una in The Nurse's Secret that's um, pretty flawed, <laughs> you just have so much more room to to sort of put the pressure on them to change. And I think that's what's interesting. As a reader, I relate more to characters who are slightly flawed. Um, certainly I'm flawed myself. And I also, I, I want to believe in this, this, this narrative of change that we can change, that we can grow. And so I enjoy watching, I enjoy watching that journey. And that's probably why I, um <laughs> make characters who sort of follow that um that arc so um you know do you find that um your nursing background inspires you to pick topics mm-hmm. or is it sort of that you know that's what you know and that's what interests you i mean what cuz the medical connection cuz i think we should say that your best selling book the second life of Muriel West takes place in a leper, leper colony. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really about, it's a true historical, st- yeah. true story. Not, I mean, it's not a true story, but it's historical fiction about a real leper colony in the okay. United States that, that was in Carville, Louisiana, um, that was uh, um, instrumental in the United States in a place where people with leprosy went because of the fear of spread. So, um, you know, tell us how that, how being a nurse impacts what you write about and what interests you. So one of the things they always say to new writers is they say, write what you know. And with my first book, I didn't do that. I didn't want to do that at all. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in writing um, about medicine or anything like that. I had, I had my idea um, and the story operates completely outside of what you would call like medical fiction. But then when I was writing my second book, The Undertaker's Assistant, again, I wasn't drawn to like a medical theme. I knew I wanted to write about reconstruction. I'm kind of interested in parts of history that, you know, haven't necessarily been explored that much or sometimes I think um, have been misrepresented um, or intentionally silenced. And so um, I wanted to write about Reconstruction, the period right after the Civil War. But um, I was at the time reading an article in the New Republic about um, a woman whose daughter had died, very young daughter, I think she was six years old, she died from leukemia. And the mom wanted to um, have a home funeral. And the the article talked about all of the challenges that they faced because uh, there are a lot of places, a lot of states, you know, talking about regulations where you can, where that's not not allowed and or places where there's so many um, hoops that you have to jump through, but in able to for you to do that. And so it was, you know, it's sort of this idea that we have become a little bit sterile in the way that we think about death and certainly the way that we handle death. And, you know, being a nurse, I've, I've seen that I've seen this separation of, you know, you're completely involved with this person and the care all the way up until that moment and then you're supposed to just cut it off and so I was really interested in the way that that in the 19th century funeral customs and certainly mourning customs were so much different um and you know I think we'll see a little bit of that you know you were mentioning about Queen Elizabeth you know the way we mourn I mean it helps us heal and in the 19th century there was so much um ritual around that. And I, and I think in some ways it's really helpful. And so that's, so because I read that article, I was like, this is so interesting. How do I bring this into the story? And I made the character um, an embalmer's assistant. And I just found that I loved it. I loved doing that research. I think being a nurse helps me a little bit in that the research is more accessible. I can read about various medical procedures and I have a baseline knowledge. 
um, you know, that lets me understand it a little bit. And then with the second life of Muriel West, which is, as you mentioned, about the, the leper colony that was in Louisiana operating for over 100 years, uh, I, again, I was interested in this idea that this is something I had never heard about, even as a nurse, even as an infection prevention nurse. Um, I knew next to nothing about leprosy or, or Hansen's disease, as we call it today. Um, and so then the more that I researched, the more fascinated I became. And again, I think having the nursing background helped me approach it in, um, in a way that made it less daunting for me. But then I'm always careful, even with um, the nurse's secret, as I mentioned, Una, the main character, she's a thief. She's <laughs> She's not even really a nurse trainee and I part of that was intentional because I want my stories to be accessible to anyone I don't want the reader to have to have a nursing background or a medical background to understand it and so um like I said Una is a thief she knows nothing about you know anatomy for example and the main character of the second life of Muriel West she's just a woman who develops the disease and is carted away to Louisiana, separated from her family, and is sort of dealing with that realization of the disease and the trauma of being split apart by her family. So I would say that it's it's started certainly in an accidental way, but I, I very much enjoyed it. And I find that medical history is something that that just fascinates me, the way that we that we have grown over the the centuries. Um and and it brings a way to kind of explore, I think, some some things that have been, you know, not so heavily explored in our in our history. Yes, you know, a lot of people since the pandemic have written about the Spanish flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a bunch of those books have come out. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, I, I was talking to friends about is that most of us who I'm, I'm 69. So most of us our age had grandparents who lived through the Spanish flu pandemic and never really talked about it. My grandparents never talked about it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think they were now exploring, you know, what happened then and how, what a sentinel event it was in our, not in the United States, in world history, yeah. because of, the, you know, they estimate the numbers vary, but some people think as many as 60 million people died worldwide mm -hmm. uh, during that Spanish flu pandemic um, and no vaccines, of course. And, um, and so I think, you know, what happens is we come up with something like COVID and people don't really have that history to appreciate that this has happened before, you know, in a much bigger way. Um, and what can we learn from what happened in, you know, 1918, 1919, um, in terms of how we manage this medical situation today. So I think history helps us so much. And I think, um, I think, I think medical history is also fascinating as a hospital administrator. Sure, so, absolutely. So are you working on a book now that has a medical history? Um, only slightly. My The book that I'm working on currently is about a snake oil salesman, a woman snake oil salesman, <laughs> um, and her troupe. She's got a, a traveling medicine show. So she's out there flinging cure-alls um, that, that don't really don't really work, except, except there is the placebo effect, right? Um, and she and her troop end up in Galveston, Texas in um, 1900 when they had the great storm that was the, the hurricane that was the greatest natural disaster that the country's ever seen. Um, and so it's about them being there, trying, of course, to survive the storm and then the aftermath because what happened, um, you know, the island was was completely devastated. And uh, and I think so part of it is there's a little bit of the the medical aspect of you know the most of what she sells is is snake oil but some of it does have um you know real some medicinal value yes. yes and then just i think the, there is healing in other things right so you know i certainly mentioned the placebo effect but i think there's healing in community and healing in um in music healing in um entertainment and so there's uh, an aspect of that in the story as well yeah, so there, see, it's still a little, it's, yeah. still, it's still a little medical yeah. um, on the fringe. So I want to go back, Amanda, and I think our, our, those who attend our webinars love to know more about the author. So here you are as a nurse and, you know, an expert in, you know, infection control and, you know, prevention. And um, 
you used to get this idea that you want to be a writer. And you're famous as having quoted that, you know, you worked on this for you were going to quit nursing. And then after five years, you still had not sold the book and found an agent. And your husband had said, go for it at the beginning. And after five years, you said, well, I don't know, maybe this is a working. And I love this, that he said, try longer. That's it, your quote. So talk about that process of you making the switch and, you know, kind of the work that went into it and, and you know, that you didn't give up. Sure. Yeah. I, I will say to begin with, yeah, my husband has been incredibly supportive and I'm very, very lucky because it's a hard and long <laughs> path. And having him there throughout it has, you know, made a huge difference. Uh, when I was kind of first starting in nursing, I had a job. Um, initially, I, I wasn't in infection prevention. I did NICU, and I didn't, uh, I didn't love where I was working uh, to the point that I, I hated going to work. Um, and I just every single day felt um, like drudgery to the point that I would like think about as I was driving to work, I would think, well, what if, if if I just got in a very small accident, you know, and I wasn't hurt and they weren't hurt, but I didn't have to go to work, like that would be ideal. And then I thought, I, I took a step back and I was like, Amanda, that is crazy. That is a terrible thing to think ever. And and that's no way to live. And, and I was very lucky again in my situation with, with a very, very supportive husband. And I just said, you know, I, I wanna try this. I've loved writing from, you know, when I was a very small child, it's always been one of my passions and I want to give it a go. So I did again, another piece of writing advice that they always say is don't quit your day job, but I did. And I wrote a novel that's none of the books that are published. <laughs> it was just a learning novel. And then I sort of had this thought of like, okay, here's, I'm done. <laughs> where, where is my book contract? And where are all of my, you know, adoring readers? I just had no sense of then like the industry, right? So you get, you write the book, but you also have to get it published. So then I had to do a whole bunch of learning about that and, um, you know, starting to revise the book and teach myself not only how to write a book, but how do you make a book better? Um, and then by the time I realized that the first book I had written was needed a lot more work, I already had the idea for the book that would become Between Earth and Sky. And so I shelved that initial book. A lot of writers will have that, a uh, a book that they wrote initially that that never gets published. It's really it's a learning experience like any other um, profession. And then with Between Earth and Sky, I wrote I wrote it very quickly. The first draft was done in a matter of months, but then I worked on it for about six years after that, making it better, getting advice from from agents, from other writers, going to writing groups, and just revising and revising and revising until finally um, I did find an agent and we found a publisher. But I guess uh, go way back about a year into my <laughs> writing journey, I realized, right, that, well, this isn't a quick a quick thing for most, for most um, writers, that this was gonna take me longer than I thought. And so I went back um, to a different hospital, found a different job. And I will say that's a great thing about nursing is it's so, it's so flexible and I can work part-time, I can work, you know, a couple of days a week. Um, I can start out in NICU and then transition and do infection prevention. It's just, it, it really does offer you a world of opportunity and has has been great to sort of do at the same time. It lets me, when I'm at the hospital, I'm 100% focused on that, on being there. You have to be, right, when you're doing medicine. Um, and it's almost like a break from the creative side, from the right brain side that I do when I'm at home writing. So not a lot, not all of our readers who are not in healthcare will know that NICU stands for neonatal intensive care unit. Thank you. Yeah. So you were, so you were a neonatal intensive care dealing mm -hmm. with little tiny pre Tiny babies. Yeah. yeah. Why did you choose NICU? You know, I will say that um, even though the, the babies, obviously that, that come to the neonatal ICU, that those babies are, they're sick. They wouldn't go there if they're not. Oftentimes they're very, very premature. Even in that, it is still a very happy place to be. Your, your parents are still happy that they had a baby, even if the birthing experience didn't turn out the way that um, they had envisioned. And a lot of people would would come up to me and say, "Oh, you work in the NICU? That must be so sad." And I would say, "No, it's 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 actually amazing. It's incredible. Babies are so resilient and." 
90% of my memories and, and the experiences and were, were overarchingly so, so positive. And, and I enjoyed that and I enjoyed working with, with the families. And so I think that's what, what brought me to the NICU in the beginning. So how long ago was it when you last practiced as a nurse? Um, 60, well, so I'm, I'm still, my license is still operational. I still work at the hospital, but I don't do bedside care. So I, my last bedside job was maybe six years ago. Mm. Um, yeah. And then now I do sort of behind the scenes work. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. So tell us about your writing process. I think I, I you said very casually that, um, well, you know, so I worked on that book for six years. So <laughs> people who aren't writers kind of gap when you say that, you know, like, six years I mean they can't you know that's that that takes a lot of fortitude and stick to itiveness and grit um so tell us about your writing process and do you outline everything in advance do you do you write from eight o'clock to eleven o'clock in the morning faithfully mm -hmm. how does that work for you I'm definitely an outliner they um I find it's helpful for me to get a picture of the story in my head in advance so I do a lot of, I would say like creative work in my head as I'm as I'm coming to the story. So for example, with the nurse's secret that didn't take me six years, it took me just you know a much shorter time frame. I spent about um, six months researching and also kind of circling the story idea because again I knew I wanted to write about this period of early nursing, but I wasn't sure how to approach the story. Um, and then once I once I sort of found Una, the main character, and, and realized like this is how I want to approach the story with her, this fish out of water character, um, then it was easier to kind of get the outline in place and write. Um, it varies for me. Sometimes I have very specific outlines that are, you know, this chapter and then this chapter and then this chapter, what happens in each one. Sometimes I'll have a little bit more loose where I'll have just major plot points that I'm working toward. And then, um, and then I do, once I've got that outline, I just write and I try not to edit at all as I'm going. I'm a firm believer in this idea of a very messy first draft that you just have to sort of let, let the, the words come. It's um, very easy for that internal critic to sort of sit on your shoulder and be like, well, this is terrible writing. No one is ever gonna want to read this. And this is so boring. And why are you even doing this? And so sort of to silence that um, critic, I just, I write quick um, and from start, essentially start to finish. Sometimes that'll take four months. Sometimes that takes six to eight months, depending on the story. And, and then I'll step, step back and look at it and say, okay, where are the holes? What do I need to fix? And as I mentioned with Between Earth and Sky, I was, I was new and that took, that took a long time. Um, and, and part of, again, that process was also, you know, finding the agent. Now I have an agent, I've got my publisher. Um, so it's just about me stepping back looking at the story and saying, okay, how, how can I fix this? Getting other people, um, to read the story, to recommend, um, changes and, and then implementing them. And do you have a routine that you follow mm. that you, I, I mean, discipline about, I'm going to put in three hours every day, or how do you do that? When I'm doing the writing phase in particular, I, I try to have a word count goal. Um, so maybe my goal would be to write two or three pages, two to five pages maybe um, a day. And, and that helps me kind of stay on track. Um, I do write better in the morning. I like to wake up and, and start fresh, but I've also found that, you know, life, life gets in the way. I mean, certainly I think COVID taught me that because the um, circumstances of the hospital were so different, um, dire at some points that, you know, I was needed there more. And so it was finding like chunks of time to write. So maybe not for eight hours straight, but writing before work and writing after work and, you know, scratching out a few sentences here and there. Um, and then, and then cobbling together. Ideally, I think I would sit down, you know, and just spend the day writing, but it doesn't always work that way. And I find I've got to balance that with, um, with the other things that, that come up. And are you in writer's 
groups where you exchange, you know, stories and and uh, critique each other that have been helpful to you? Yes, I will say, especially for anyone that's listening that would like to to be a writer, give writing a try, I would say definitely find a group um, that's a good fit for you, right? That's um, kind and and wants to see you grow. I I know for me that helped a lot. I joined a writers group here in town maybe 12 years ago and they were very instrumental in both just kind of showing me the way to to sort of do things but also to point out things that I just didn't I didn't recognize in my own writing. Um, in addition to that larger group, I have a group of of author friends and we will have a little critique group and we'll share our writing with one another. Uh, and that's that's incredibly helpful too because again there's just there's things that you don't that you don't that you don't see in your own writing um that it's easier to see in other people's writings and so I find I find their their feedback so helpful and also just their support because in some ways it is a very like solitary profession you spend a lot of time on your own writing uh and also it can be you know it's a difficult profession you hear no all the time and it doesn't stop when you know you you find an agent or a publisher like you're still hearing no from places so no, this isn't the right story or no you know we can't we don't want to you know do this book event or things like that um and so it just takes you you need a group of of people that are understand the uniqueness of the the job and are there to support you and you know cheer you on when things are going great and and then kind of keep you going when you're when things are looking down yeah, I was thinking of the word cheerleader when you were talking about, you know, that you're really in a support group that, that is a cheerleader group, cheerleading group. So um, we have a question from Kathy Goodman, who's one of our members, and Hi. she has two questions. And the first is, what's your favorite book? Mm. Ooh, that is a tough question. Um, my favorite book is probably Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. I really um, read that book the first time when I was in high school in, uh, I think, a senior year, and it just really, it just stuck with me over over and over again. It just, you know, every time I come to it, it speaks to me in a different way. And I think that's a really neat thing about a book, when you can read it at different points in your life and you get different things out of it. And that book is definitely one of those for me. So uh, her other question is, which of your favorite books was the most challenging to write? <laughs> um probably the second life of Muriel West was the most challenging. Um the initial story came on very quickly uh for me. I I kind of settled in, I wrote the whole thing, and then I sent it, you know, I mentioned I have you know friends and and people who read it, and I sent it to my agent and also my group of critique partners, and um they all came back and were like, ooh. This isn't good. <laughs> and you know, you also um had mentioned Janet about the um you didn't use the word unlikable, but I'll use the word unlikable protagonist. <laughs> the initial draft of the story, Muriel is very unlikable, even more so than in than in the current book. She's a little prickly in the beginning of warning to all of you. Um and uh Let, let's call it like it is. She's spoiled. She's spoiled, <laughs> yes. <laughs> she is. She's terribly. She's spoiled. She's entitled. Um, she's lived a very privileged yes. environment when this yes. comes up. So right. she's spoiled. Yes. <laughs> and and in the first draft, that just there there wasn't enough balance, right? Because yes, you want again, you want a character that can change, but the reader has to want to keep reading, and that wasn't the case. And so essentially, my my editor was like, "You need to do this," or and this and this and they were just gigantic changes and I ended up throwing out two-thirds of the novel and rewriting it all again and I needed an extension um from my editor and this was all happening right at the very very beginning of COVID when there was so much that was unknown and and you know that moment is is when you're an infection preventionist is really important that you're you know there at the hospital helping out with PPE and all these things and and getting the, the CDC guidance right, all that. So all of it just kind of distilled into a very stressful, <laughs> a stressful period of trying to get the book right. Um, 
but I will say at the same time, like it's, it was also maybe the most rewarding because one, it taught me like, okay, I can do that. I can take something that wasn't that great <laughs> and I can reshape it. I think that's really the power of revision. I can reshape this into something that's better. And, and maybe it was, I don't know, fortuitous, I'll say at least that I was writing it again as, as the pandemic was starting because, you know, Janet, you mentioned the flu of 1919 and how we just didn't, we didn't have a lot of knowledge about that to sort of support our experience with COVID and having learned about Hansen's disease and all of these people who had been sent to Carville and quarantined for life, right? Um, many of them in many cases, that just gave me such perspective because I thought, you know, this happened to them and they made it through, they lived meaningful lives, they found love and enjoyment. Again, quarantined in a hospital in rural Louisiana, if they can do that, we certainly can come through this pandemic as well. And so it was challenging to write at the same time that it was going on, but it was, it gave me such perspective and hope. It gave me great hope for, for our own circumstances. Yes. You know, I was from reading and learning and studying a lot about the Spanish flu pandemic, you know, where you appreciate how we could get on the news every night during COVID and see facts about mm -hmm. what was going on in terms of deaths, what, what the spread was, what the recommended guidance was, and how you really appreciate how during the Spanish flu pandemic, everything was word of mouth you know, Barbara Street died. Did you hear Barbara died? You know, I mean, we didn't have, they didn't have the massive social communication and how you were so dependent on the grapevine to even get a whiff of what was going on. And, and I, you know, I think when you study historical events, read books about them, it makes you appreciate, even though the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has been horrible, it makes you appreciate how much fortunate we are, how much more fortunate we are than those who went through, you know, the, the world's worst pandemic a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, you know, writers like you who bring like the leprosy story to light help, um, help us to appreciate how fortunate we are now. Mm. Yes. Thank you. And I, I agree. I, I, I think that's why I love historical fiction. I, there is so much from the past that is relevant to today and, and knowing about that, knowing about what happened, it, it can help us um, navigate our current world. And when you write, Amanda, do you write, do you have in mind who your reader is? And how do you think about who you're writing for? I mean, do you have in mind an age group, a demographic? Um, uh, how, do you, how do you write so that your voice is heard and what your target audience is? I, I do have a, a sense of my reader. I'm the marketing side of me could certainly tell you this is who my reader is in terms of, you know, age demographics and um, all sorts of things. But as a writer, when I'm thinking about my reader, it's a little bit more flexible, um, a little bit more amorphous, maybe, uh, only in that. I really want to tell them a good story, right? And that, you know, I'm thinking, especially as I'm revising, because when I'm writing that first draft, part of that is me telling myself the story, because I've, I've, I've got to find the story, I've got to, to create it. And so some of that is, is me telling myself the story. And then as I go to subsequent drafts and, and revise, that's me really thinking about the reader. And, you know, is this sentence clear? or with a lot of like the medical stuff, like is this going to make sense to someone who doesn't have a nursing background, for example? Um, that's when I think I'm much more focused on the reader and and their experience of the story. Yes. Well, you know, Amanda, hopefully what we've done today is encourage those who are watching and listening today to uh, become familiar with you as a writer and to explore your books. Because I, I, like I said, I, I, feel, I feel like kind of our, not put downable, uh, which I think is one of the most, you know, the greatest compliments you can get. And uh, I look forward to hearing from, you know, more books that you write. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Robin. Yes. 
Janet, if you would put put me back on video, <laughs> start my video. Let me go here. There we go. There you go. Wow. So that, Robin, yes, that was okay. great. That was great. Very interesting. And you know, one thing I I that really struck me in that interview is it's such you the perseverance. If you want to be a writer, you know, and she talked about the years and the rewrites and the no, it's so many no's that she received. You've got to have that passion. You've got to stick with it. And it's a very complicated process. You know, one of my favorite recent books is nonfiction. It's called Grit. I may have talked about it before. And it's written by a woman who studied this notion of grit, stick to itiveness. Right. And she starts the book by talking about studying West Point cadets where they have thousands of people apply. They narrow it down. They accept 1,200. And they put them through six weeks of cleave week. And, you know, 10% of them drop back. Right. And they try to figure out, we've done all this screening. What's going on? And when she brought in the grit test, which shows stick to this, it wasn't the person who were most athletic that succeeded. It wasn't those who had the highest GPA. All these things at West Point were measuring. It was the grit test, which is, do you just say, I'm not going to give up? I'm not going to give up. predictive who would make it. So right. I do want to acknowledge today, Nancy Fish, who has been on this journey with us since the beginning and has been you know, a technical person extraordinaire. And right, where's on. Nancy? Nancy, she's there. Nancy, we yes. want to see you. Nancy, there. Yeah. Oh, Nancy, Nancy. Yay, Nancy. Yay, Nancy. <laughs> and I also want to acknowledge Bobby Helbig, who schedules yeah. all of our authors, and Bobby's uh, in Europe right now. Um, right. So um, so we've had a great team, and, and this has been a team effort, and Robin, you've been a terrific teammate, too. So I'm well, going to turn it over to you, because you're going to give a little update on some upcoming Wahi events for us. I, I will. And sorry, I had to, <laughs> I have a little bit of a sinus infection this week. It's not COVID. I, I tested negative, but it was just like, oh, so sorry. I had to tickle my throat. But our next author series webinar will be on November 10th. And that author is Kimberly Brock. And it's the book of the lost book of Eleanor Dare. So that sounds um, fascinating. So November the 10th, and there's so many things on the calendar coming up, as you know, I'm program chair this year, and so honored to work with the leadership team, Claudia Aller, our president, and so many others, you know, certainly Nancy Fish is our VP of events, but there, there's just, there's, there's a plethora of programs coming up, beginning with our kickoff and expo, which is on September 22nd. Um, you've seen the invite, please register now. Um, I do want to just mention that um, it is different. I know it's not a it's not a luncheon, but it is an opportunity to come back and and welcome. You know, it's kind of a homecoming. Actually, you know, Wahi began as a small group of women at Caligny. There was a, it was a garden club, and so here we are, sixty two late sixty two years later, coming coming back to be with each other. The interest groups will be present, and so you can sign up. We'll have these guys playing in the background. Make sure to bring a chair, and we ask no coolers. Please wear your pink. There will be a contest with a fantastic prize, which is, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it's a $100 gift certificate, gift certificate for Celeste, a new restaurant on the North End. So it's going to be a wonderful opportunity. There'll be snacks available. It's only $20 to register if you would like to have a guest. Um, you can have up to two guests in there, $25 a piece. All of the information is on the invite and also on the website. But before that, we're going to review all of our programs on the 20th, which is on Tuesday um, at a secret location. It will be a Zoom, and many of you have already signed up. And we have a special speaker that will kind of set the stage. As you know, our theme this year is finding joy, finding joy in each other, finding joy in learning, finding joy in the holidays, finding joy in our community and outreach and service. And so our speaker will talk about her journey and how she found joy. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're also happy to be, be uh, bringing to you my learner and a Broadway series. Have you seen that's in October? You know, I felt it was important to give tribute to our veterans. We have veterans that are our women of Wahi. We have our women that have sons or daughters. I have a son that just retired from the Air Force or spouses that served in the military. So we have a, a fun little event that will be in November, on November 18th. So look at the calendar where we have one of our own Wahi women who was a retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force, and she will be our speaker. Plus, an original song written by one of our 
Wahi women. She wrote the lyrics. Her daughter did, composed the music, and it will be sung and is called Where's Freedom? So that will be at USCB Hilton Head. Of course, the Chef series continues. We've got a big fundraiser, the Hall Halloween event in October. And then I did want to remind you that we have um, our December event will be December the 8th, and it will be at uh, the Beach and Tennis Club, and it will be the gift of joy, all about gifts, the gifts that are in our talents that we give others, um, not so much the, the um, tangible gifts, but the gifts that we give each other and to our community. And so we'll be at the Beach and Tennis, and we will have some performances, and it'll be a lot of fun. So, so much coming up. Again, I want to thank the team. Uh, author series continues this year. This is our 25th uh, webinar. And um, just thank you for joining us. The book is called uh, The Nurse's Secret by Amanda Skenendor. And it was a great interview. Good job, Janet. And we'll see you on November the 10th as we have uh, as we bring to you our next webinar in the author series for the Women's Association of Hilton Head Island. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you on September 22nd at Celebration Park. It's 3.30 to 6, 6.30. You don't have to come and stay the whole time, but just come. I want to see all of you there. We'll have a lot of fun and fellowship. Bye, everyone.